We're starting the Apostles' Creed. And tweet number one of the Apostles' Creed goes like this. I believe in God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And if you go on to Twitter, you can even talk while we're in, in church if you want. Uh, if you go on to Twitter and look at 12 tweets, you'll find that I tweeted that this morning. It tells us two fundamental things about God. It tells us that he is our heavenly father, that we can relate to him as a child does to a loving father. Now I'm well aware that for some of us, our fathers are not people that we want to admire. For me, my father is someone I admire. And I know I'm one of the lucky ones. I remember growing up thinking, you know, I want to be like my dad. But that can't be said for all of us. But our God is all that a father should be without the failings of, of a human being. He is our heavenly father. And secondly, it tells us that he is the maker of heaven and earth. In other words, he is responsible for our existence here today. I believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. Well, where did that statement come from? In about AD 390, a group of Christian leaders got together in Milan to settle on a way of understanding what we believe as Christians by using a, a set of pithy sayings, 12 tweets. And that was the origin of the Apostles' Creed, and we have been using it ever since. Now, there are other creeds. There's the Nicene Creed and some others, and you can, uh, you can search for those on the internet, and you'll find lots of them. The Apostles' Creed is probably the longest, and we are working through that between now and, and Easter. And at first sight, some of these statements appear very basic. However, when you sit down and think about them, they open up enormous depths of the faith that have day-to-day -day relevance for us in our lives. And that's the thing I think we're going to find as we go through the Apostles' Creed. Being a Christian is not merely giving mental assent to a bunch of doctrines. It's living a lifestyle that is consistent with a relationship with God. And so these tweets that we have, these 12 pithy sayings that comprise the Apostles' Creed, are things that have deep practical relevance for each of us. So, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. So what do people think about God? Well, there are all sorts of approaches, all sorts of things that come to mind and that will come out in conversation if you start talking about God. For some people, God is just absent. He isn't there. He isn't anywhere. And the consequence of that tends to be a life that has little meaning or purpose. But it has a deep logical flaw because if you say God doesn't exist, you're always at the mercy of some Christ follower who comes along and says, actually, I know him. I remember going to a conference some years ago where I, I turned up at the beginning and Rosie was going to join me a, a day or so later. There were 3,000 people there. And I could say, oh, Rosie isn't here yet. But my friend said, oh, she is. He, she is. I've seen her. Now, that friend must be right because he had seen her arrive at the conference, even though I could look around and say, well, I can't see her here. The only way I could prove that she wasn't is to check through every individual. And that's the problem with saying God is absent. You're always at the mercy of someone who says, I know him. For some people, God is irrelevant. I can get along quite well without God, they say. I can cope. But then I think I'd want to ask, well, who gave you the capacity to cope? Where did that come from? And how will you cope when something genuinely difficult happens in your life? Maybe a business crisis or a, a health crisis or a relationship crisis. Personally, I, I wouldn't wish such a crisis on anyone. But we all know that God uses even crises to draw us to himself. And to say, buddy, you need to take me seriously. I can help you through this. Other people say, well, God is just unnecessary. And often such folk will argue very roughly that science and philosophy have explained or at least potentially are able to explain all that I need to know about reality. And that's a very dangerous argument. 
because I only need to find one thing that can't be explained by the scientific worldview and by my hypothesis, and the whole idea falls flat on its face. What about love? You can't put that in a test tube. Uh, a, a textbook that had to be says written from a very atheistic point of view once described a kiss as, quote, the approach of two pairs of lips with a reciprocal transmission of microorganisms and carbon dioxide. <laughs> you try telling that to two people in love. <laughs> For some people, God is nasty. He's the one who comes along to condemn and to punish. And the bad stuff in life is him stamping on us from on high. Whereas for others, God is within you. Some people say, well, if you want to find God, then go on an inner quest. Examine yourself. Get in touch with your feelings. Now, to be sure, not knowing your feelings and, and, and being aware of yourself is, it can lead to some problems in life. Knowing yourself is a good thing. But if that's where you're going to find God... I have a problem, because if God is within Ian Richard White, he's a very small God. Nowhere near strong enough to satisfy the deepest cravings of the human heart. And the fact that unsatisfied cravings exist means that God can't be truly within us, otherwise he would have satisfied them. So what I want to do today and in this whole series is to take a biblical look at God and about walking the Christian life. I'm intrigued by the marathon that's run, or well, quite often there are lots of marathons around, particularly the marathon at the Olympics or one of the international championships because there you have elite athletes running the course and thousands of people spectating. And the danger of the Christian church and of, of the Christian life is that we can be spectators. For me, I want to be a runner. I want to be one of the people who runs the race, not merely sits on one side and talks about the race. Fascinating though it is. Now, now the trouble with, with, with doing the Apostles' Creed or with any... Uh, creed like this is that we tend to start talking theology and uh, the trouble with talking about God is we start using some very long words even the word theology is scary for some people all theology is is logic about God that's where the word comes from theo on the beginning and logic on the end so if you say anything logical about God you're doing theology so let me introduce you or at least remind you of several long word concepts that we have in relation to God. Every, every subject has its shorthand. I mean, you know I used to be a ma mathematician and we used to talk about P-silo groups and homomorphisms and power series, all with a very, very particular meaning. Now, some of these long words, they have a particular meaning. They're long words to explain relatively simple concepts. Take omniscience, for example. Our God is omniscient. There's nothing he doesn't know. Some theologians will tell you that God chooses to limit his omniscience in order to preserve our free will and dignity. That's, that's another question that you can think about later. But omniscient means there's nothing that God doesn't know. His knowledge is infinite. And then there's omnipresent. There's nowhere where he isn't. He's present everywhere. And he is actively present in a different way in every part of history. And his providence demonstrates his presence with us. And then we often talk about his omnipotence. There's nothing that he is incapable of doing. He is all-powerful. But we, we do have to dig into this a little. See, what omnipotence sounds like is this. If I ask the question, can God do X, the answer is always going to be yes. But there are a few things that God can't do. For example, he can't eradicate himself. 
We put an answer no there because then he would no longer be God. Actually, this comes out in the scriptures when Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, if we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. There is a consistency to our Heavenly Father that is deeply reassuring and one that we rely on for day-to-day life. This is an important and vital question because the dilemma for the agnostic or the unbeliever is if there isn't a God, then nothing really matters. Life has little ultimate meaning and purpose. On the other hand, if there is a God, then what he has said is of ultimate importance and significance. I was having lunch with some men and the discussion was flowing freely and we began to talk about religion in general and I made some comments about the Lord, I forget exactly what it was. And one of my friends, his name was, was Pete, He sagely put his head on one side and he said, oh, he said, you can't believe in God these days, surely. And why not? I mean, what makes these days any different from any other days? (laughs) Man is still essentially the same. And yet for many people who would not give God so much as a second thought, he is an essential backstop if all else fails. When, When a real crisis strikes, when I'm in danger of drowning or there is serious illness, or my business is going under, or there is something I can't control in life that brings me fear, many people will say to themselves and say it with real honesty, God, if you're there, get me out of this. And I'll give you my life, or I'll go to church, or they make some promise. My friend, if that's you, I want you to know that God takes you very seriously. He hears prayers, even prayers like that. And that's what makes us confident that God is so real and personal. He meets with us at the extremities of life. So... That will come up in a minute. So can I prove that God is real? The trouble with, with philosophical proofs is they tend to be rather sterile. They rest very heavily on abstract logic. And they often try to convince someone against their own personal judgment. You know the phrase, don't you? Convince a man against his will, he's of the same opinion still. So this proving process misses the essential fact that God is a real person. And while proofs are valid... That's not all that we need more than that. That's not all there is to it. I mean, can I prove that Rosie exists? It's far more meaningful to get on with deepening our relationship and enjoying life together than is approving her existence. As if all God as if all there is about God is a proof that he exists. See, when we come to the Bible, I hate to say this, there's no proof that God exists. Bible doesn't have one. The writers of the Bible assume that he is here with us and then work out the consequences from there. So where do we see God? How can I observe him? I want to suggest three places where we can see God. And the first one is simply in creation. Psalm 19, you might like to make a note of it. Psalm 19 First few verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. There is no language in which their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to the ends of the earth, the wor- their words to the end of the world. There is a universal admiration of creation. And often you'll see TV programs where a naturalist will express wonder at how nature did it, or mother nature. Try to personify nature in order to demonstrate that there's some sort of creative hand behind it all. 
But if universal admiration is there, so too is specific investigation. Some people mistakenly think that science has disproved or at least knocked big holes in Christian faith. If science is used as it was originally intended to be used, that would never be so because a scientist is not seeking to disprove Christianity or ever any other faith come to that. What he's trying, he or she is trying to do is to take an objective view of the world in order to understand and model how it functions. Sir Isaac Newton used to talk about thinking God's thoughts after him in his research. Science without wonder is a, is a sterile, sterile process. I'm uh, speaking to you through this radio mic at the moment, which looks like a sort of wart on my left cheek, but that's... Um, and inside here, there's a little thing that's wiggling backwards and forwards. And it's wiggling backwards and forwards at 863.025 million times per second. That's quick. And that's how you're hearing me. Now, look, take a look at your own hand. Just have a, have a quick look at it. Your hand is infinitely more complex than my radio transmitter. And we know that the human body is, is far more complex than we can understand. Now, could that have happened by chance? Yes, to be sure, tell me, tell me if you like that it is logically possible. But please don't, you know, let's not kid ourselves as what the evidence suggests. I see God in creation. I also see God in conscience. Our alarm clock woke us up this morning at 7 o'clock and I pressed snooze and 10 minutes later it did the whole process again. Conscience is God's moral alarm clock. Trouble is we press snooze a bit too often sometimes. And we need to take God's prompting in our lives very seriously indeed. And the third place, or a third place, there are so many, but the third place I see God is in Christ himself. That's going to be next week's, or it'll be week after. That's our next tweet. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and also I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. That's going to be our next tweet on the uh, uh, 29th of Jan, I think. So three places where we see God in creation, in the natural order of things, in conscience, in the inner order of things, and in Christ, the one who came to give his life for us. And we shall see that on another Sunday. So what is God like? And that brings us to our Bible reading. So if you'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 40... It's on page 724 if you're using the church Bible. Or you can jump to it if you've got your gizmo working. Verse 9. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go, go up onto a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. That was the best they could do for broadcasting. Go to a high place and shout. Here's a herald proclaiming, here is your God, announcing the arrival of God and telling us what he's like. And it tells us some key things about God. He is personal. Here is your God. Christianity is fundamentally not just a code of ethics. It is a relationship with a person. And that person is God himself. Wonder of wonders. And my dear friend, you will never know the reality of Christian faith until you know God personally. And if you say to yourself, actually, you know, I've got a few queries over that alpha is might be a good place for you to come and engage in the conversation at least at least we can help sketch in the basics for you he is personal he's your god verse 10 see the sovereign lord comes with power and his arm rules for him his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him so he's powerful 
He's a man who exerts influence in the world and in our lives. Verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Along with that power is a very real gentleness that God displays in his relationship with us. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with a breath of his hand marked off, the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountain on a set of scales and put the hills in a balance? These are rhetorical questions and he's asking us to make some, uh, make some comparisons and he's showing us that, that God is majestic. He's enormously big. He measure off, measures off the heavens with the breadth of, it, the breadth of his hand a way in which they measure things in those days. Who can compare with that? Or verse 13, who's understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counsellor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who is it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Nobody. God is wise and carries, embodies wisdom. So verse 18, to whom will you then compare God? What image will you compare him to? Our God is incomparable. There is no image that will completely uh, exemplify who he is and satisfy a description of him. He is always greater than our minds can comprehend. In fact, the way Isaiah does this, and you can see this in verse 19, is he compares him with an idol. Of course, we have our idols. We you know, we polish them on a Sunday or we get them serviced at the garage very often or whatever. And... Um, As for an idol, a craftsman crafts it, verse 19, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present this kind of offering selects wood that won't rot. Well, I suppose it helps that God doesn't rot, doesn't it? He looks for a skilled craftsman who will set up this idol so that it won't topple over, as if the greatest achievement of this idol is it won't fall down. (laughs) Do you not know, verse 21? Haven't you heard... Wasn't it told you from the beginning? Haven't you understood since the earth was founded? Can you see how sarcastic Isaiah is being about idols? How does the Lord compare with that? Verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to nothing and reduces the rulers of this world to naught. Rulers of this world, beware. No sooner are they planted and no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like an empty crisp packet. God is greater than international politics. International negotiations are like chats between school kids compared with his wisdom and chat and stature. My friends, this is your God. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. Let's bow in prayer.